Thank you for tuning into this teaching. We hope this message blesses you. Our mission as Marigold Church is to do anything and everything so that anyone and everyone can encounter the real Jesus. We hope as you listen to this, you encounter the real Jesus. Let him transform your mind, transform your heart, and encounter you today. I hope that you came ready to to listen, to hear, and to do. Um, We're going to go into the second part of uh, of a prayer, of, of this message on prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And let's read this together. I, I, I think it's important that we, that we know how to pray. I love a, a, a quote by Smith Wigglesworth. I don't know. Has anybody ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? He's like a British uh, speaker back in, back in way before my time. But I love a lot of his quotes. I've read several of his books, and I really like, I really like him. I, uh, and he's kind of like kind of like an old work with your hands kind of guy, which I really admire. He was a plumber turned a preacher, and uh, and and so th- there's I have a great admiration for people who who work with their hands. And uh, but he said this. He said I don't often spend more than half an hour in prayer at one time, but I never go more than half an hour without praying. Prayer was a part of his life. It was a central part of his life. And it was something that it was ongoing. And I think that that that's got to be our attitude. I I do. I do understand the idea of getting up and having a regiment. I do understand that. Like, okay, every day at at 5 a.m. I'm going to do this and this and this. And I'm going to and I'm going to do this. uh, I'm going to do these exercises. I'm going to eat this. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to read. I do, I, I, I do understand regimen. I think it's important to, 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 to get you into that, like that, that mode of, you know, just repetition and, and getting into good habits. However, there, there comes a time where it cannot be habit and it has to be relational. Okay. If I tell my wife every day at 5 a.m., you and I, were going to talk for five minutes. I don't think that's going to work. Okay. Because we, it requires more for us to grow. Now, if we're not in talking terms, it may be good that we schedule some talking together. But that shouldn't be the norm. And so we want that to be a norm. Now, imagine going all day and never talking to someone who's walking with you all day long. That's the Holy Spirit. He's walking with you all day long. And so when you talk with Him... Uh, it, it shouldn't be a regiment. I know you're here with me all day, but at five o'clock, me and you are having a conversation. It shouldn't be like that. We should ha- go have this ongoing prayer. And what I want us to to do, and and we'll do this actually after the the, the Lord's prayer series. We're going to continue in prayer even after we finish the Lord's prayer. Is is we're going to look at Jesus's prayer life, and we're going to see different people's prayer life in the Bible. Jesus had a very interesting prayer life. Um, it wasn't regimented. He prayed when he needed to pray. And you and I, we need to learn how to pray. Uh, and, and, and it's the Lord himself, Jesus, that taught us to pray. And this is what he said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. We're just going to look at the NIV version for the sake of uh, this. Normally, I look at NASB, uh, the New American Standard Bible. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I, I always say that the, the best version of the Bible is the one that you read and that you allow to read you. But here we're using the NIV. So our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Last week, we talked about our, our, our mission and our motivation as we celebrated one year, one year of, of Marigold Church planted in a, in a pandemic. Who would have thought? But, uh, but before that, we had part one, which was our Father in heaven. Today, we're going to talk about hallowed be your name. Now, the Lord's Prayer, if you're, if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, you'll see that there's a, a pattern that's very similar between the, the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, and if you're not familiar, I, I encourage you, we do have a, a, a series. A, it's a 10-part or 12-part series, something like that, uh, called uh, Ten. 
And it talks about the Ten Commandments, and we break each one down. So go back and watch that. But uh, we talk about the first, the first part, the first five commandments have to do with God's relationship with man and man's relationship with God. The last five have to do with man's relationship with man. It has to do with man, the first five with God, the second five with man. And uh, someone, some people will uh, debate me on commandment number five, honor the mother and the father, but, um, but, and saying, well, that's about man and, and, and uh, man, and I, I completely disagree. Uh, and because it's Mother's Day, I'll say this. The way you honor your mother is a, is a form of worship to the Lord. The, the way you honor your father is a worship to the Lord if it's done right. It can be a damnation to the Lord, too. You can be, it can be, or really a damnation to you, but you can be, um, uh, bring damnation on yourself in the way that you treat your mother and father on earth. This, it is not something that to mess around with. It does not say you have to agree with your mother and father on everything, but it does say you honor them in everything that you do. I can look back, and my parents need to close their ears when I say this, but I can look back at many, many troubles in my life that came from dishonoring my mother and father. And I don't just mean as a kid, I mean even as an adult um, in, a, in a way that I, I don't honor them. I don't honor them. I didn't honor them in a way, and it brought me uh, much trouble. So there, we have that. So the first three uh, statements in the Lord's Prayer are, are the same. They're about God, his name, his, uh, who he is, and things of that nature. The, and then the last three have to do with, with men, okay? Same thing within the commandments, the first half and then the second half, okay? So here, I'm in, and the first three phrases of the Lord's Prayer correspond to the first three commandments. The first commandment is this, you shall have no other gods before me, right? What is the first, the first two words in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, our Father, the patriarch, the number one, the number one in our life is the Father. Number two, you shall, you shall not make any graven images. It's our Father. The second is in heaven. The reason we cannot make graven images on earth is we don't, we don't, we don't see God. He's in heaven. How can you make an image of someone that you don't see? So whatever image you make to worship would be an image of yourself. It would be a, a, something that reflects you, which is why we're supposed to worship him and worship him in spirit, right? Worship in spirit and truth. And number three, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Hallowed be your name. That's the third one. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Today we're going to talk about hallowed be your name. What does hallowed mean? You've ever heard the, the phrase hallowed grounds? These are hallowed grounds. Yeah, I, I, I would not consider myself a, a buff of anything, but if anything, I would say I really, really like and, and enjoy watching uh, videos and movies and things of World War II. And Marcus says that I'm studying for a, a test that I will never take on, on, on World War II. But if I did, I think I would get a pretty good grade. But I love watching documentaries about World War II. But when you, when you hear them talk about it in the past, they talk about hallowed grounds, the hallowed grounds of Normandy, the hallowed grounds of the concentration camps, the hallowed grounds. What are these, what are these grounds? They're, they're holy. They're holy. They're set apart. They're completely set apart. You will not find them saying these hallowed grounds and then breaking the ground to build a mall. Okay, you will not find a mall on hallowed grounds. Okay, you will not find an H&M being built on hallowed grounds. Okay, there's different grounds for that. Okay, but hallowed grounds, they're holy, they're set apart. They're really untainted by time. When you look at these places, they're untainted by time where, where new things are not allowed there. New things are not built there. New things are, are not, uh, you know, it's kind of like those places get stuck in their own era. And, you know, much is the same of, of God. God is not tainted by time. He's not tainted by, by culture. He is his own. He stays in his own. He is holy 
and set apart. And we need to we need to see him as that. You know, it's interesting the name of God when he when he first when he mentions his name, he uses the 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 phrase I am. Moses said, I'm going to go to Pharaoh and do what you've said, but who do I who do I say sent me? I don't know your name. And God says, I am. That was his name. I am. That is his name. I am. I am. You know, we've talked about faith in that faith is never past tense. It's always present tense. And it's interesting that God is always present tense. I am. Not I was. I am. He is. He is who he is. He's the only one that can that can carry that name. I am. A.W. Tozer, another great preacher from way back, said this. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I would I would uh, agree with A.W. Tozer, but I would actually I would actually challenge challenge it in the sense that I would spin it in that the most important thing about us is what comes into God's mind when we are mentioned. Does he, does he, when he hears your name, does he hear a son's name or a daughter's name? Or does he hear the name of an enemy? But how we look at God is super important. How, what we, what we envision, what we encompass when we hear God is, is so important to our lives. Some people would look at or hear God's name and you, you, the, the picture of Santa Claus comes to mind. He's just, he's just the gift giver. That's it. He's just all gifts. Maybe a bearded old man that lives in some far north place. Except that instead of the North Pole, he lives in, in heaven. But he's just some old man. Maybe he's an ATM machine. It's just, you know, I get in and I give in and he, and he, and he re- gives me in return. Maybe he's an insurance agent. If I pay my premium on earth then I, I, get, I get fire insurance. I don't have to go to hell, but only if I pay my premium because if I, if I stop paying my premiums, I'm cut off, right? So maybe we look at him like an insurance agent or maybe a policeman always ready to catch you doing wrong, right? How many of you, uh, man, this week, I don't know what it was. There's this road that, that kind of, it's like a long straight road that leads to our neighborhood and it's like 40 miles an hour but me and everyone else that lives within a 20 mile radius of that place thinks it should be about 55 all right and so i'm just being real here and so that's about what we drive around there unless you see a white vehicle or a black and white vehicle whatever's in there sometimes it's the sheriff it's a white, it's the white if you see a white suv everyone you just everyone just puts on, you just see brake lights everywhere all right, is, is, is that the way God is? Is he the policeman just ready to bust you? Is that how we view him? But God is holy. Above all, he is holy. We've talked about this in heaven. The angels call out holy, holy, holy. That God is holy, holy, holy. He, we could say anything else, but they choose to say holy, holy, holy. That's who he is. And we're called to be holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25, and I'm going to read the whole thing just to give it some context. Um, I do encourage you to read the 12 verses before it. It, it, it gives you an insight into how, what the angels think about the things that have been given to us. And then it says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a salvation that is coming. We've been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Okay, Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, 
which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I am holy. Verse 17, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a blood of unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. I want to. Name off seven different things. I think there's seven. Yeah, seven different things in keeping God's name holy. How do we keep God's name holy in our life? Like the angels sing out, holy, holy, holy. How can we do that as fallen men here on earth, redeemed men? How can we do that? How, how can we keep his name holy? But before we do that, I want to talk about seven things that we can do to cause his name to be unholy, unholy. And the goal is not legalism. OK, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about a list of do's and a list of don'ts. OK, I'm talking about maturity. There are things that I did as a child that were not necessarily sinful. They were just very immature. OK, now, as a grown up, as a 40 year old man, there are certain things you would expect that I would have stopped doing, not because I'm any more uh, any sinless or any more. You know, it's not about sin or not sin. It's just maturity. OK, if you if if during worship, if you saw me running up and down the aisles. All right. And playing tag or something. There's a certain amount of like, wait a minute, this isn't right. Not because of sin, but more because of immaturity. Right? We want to be, we want to be mature. So the first thing that we can do to cause the name to be unholy in our lives is an act of perjury. Perjury. You've heard it when in, in court, you put your hand on the Bible and you raise your hand and, and do all this stuff. And, and I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's an important phrase that we use. Um, to tell the truth is in its, in, its, in its wholeness is important in our lives. The reason there's those three phrases to tell the truth. One, because you can just tell an outright lie, right? I wasn't there, but sir, we have pictures of you. <gasps> You know, it's like, you know, if you've watched, uh, you know, I don't know, court, court shows or whatever. Um, so we're encouraged to tell the truth. We're commanded to tell the truth. The whole truth. You can, you can tell a partial truth in the name of God and it be a lie, right? We'd say, uh, you know, a, 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 a half truth is a whole lie. Something we used to say in, in the house. And nothing but the truth. So you don't add to the truth, right? It's, so it's nothing taken away from it and nothing added. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So through perjury. Don't ever use the name of God in, in a way that it's gonna, it, it creates this like heightened version of what you're about to say. 
and then just follow it with an outright lie or anything. Because it, it's, it does nothing for you. I mean, obviously, it, it, it defames your name. It ruins your name. But you're dragging God's name along with it. And, and that's perjury. The other thing is profanity. Profanity. And actually, this Wednesday, I'm going to do, if, if you want to join me on Facebook, uh, live at 9 on the Marigold Church uh, Facebook, I'm going to actually do something about uh, from 9 to 9.30. I'm going to talk about cussing. I hear a lot of cussing. Uh, um, there's a lot of cussing in, in, in the world. There's a lot of cuss. I, I hear a lot of, I work in construction. So if there's a cuss word, I've heard it. And I've heard it in multiple languages, Okay. <laughs> And uh, but there's a lot of cussing, but I see a lot, I hear a lot of cussing in the church too, a lot of a lot of cussing from people, um, and and I want to talk about cussing. I want to talk about is it really a sin, is or is it just this over heightened? Oh, that's legalistic. You know, really that was something that man brought along and man made that word. So how can you know? And I get I get the argument, I, I get the argument. Um, but we'll talk about that. So I, I encourage you. And so the now here's the thing. The idea is like, well, maybe I cuss a lot, so I'm not going to watch it on Wednesday. All right. Here's the thing. You're already judged. OK, I'm telling you if that's the attitude. All right. So remember, you're not judged by what you know. You're also judged by what you couldn't know. All right, here we go. Using his name, profanity, what is profanity? Using his name or things associated with his name as a curse. Words like damn it, you know, to say that, to damn something. Don't do that lightly. I'm not saying that there's not a place for it, but stubbing your toe is not the place for it, okay? Telling someone to go to hell is not is not proper. I told someone to go to hell one time. Uh, he was actually my youth pastor, and uh, yeah, I'm not proud of it, but it's the truth. And uh, and I'll never forget it. Golly, that that I said it and I meant it and I felt it, and I and I and I it, uh, that that weighed on me for a long time. It weighed on me for a long time. Even saying things good. I heard some guy the other day say, good God Almighty. Well, yes, God is good, and he is almighty. But that's not how you meant it. And so we, we, we've got to watch it. And, and like I said, this is not about, about legalism. It's about being mature with our speech, okay? And using it in vain, using the name of God in vain, without power, without power. To take the Lord's name in vain is to use it and to take the power and the meaning out of it. So without the power, the power, profanity, profanity is using the sacred in ways that are not sacred. If you look at most cussing or cursing, you take you take one of three areas. One is relationship between man and woman. The other is relationship with man and God. And the other is you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your body. It's hard to find a curse word that does not take one of those three things and twist it. F U. What is that? It's taking something that God meant as holy, a relation, a, a, a sexual relationship between a man and a woman, and using it as a curse. Okay, and there's a lot more, but I'll leave it at that one. I'll pick that up on Wednesday, and I'll see you there. The third one, flippancy, flippancy. And it, flippancy is just at maybe sometimes it, it can be start off as harmless and, and then get into like something like it just goes too far. Sometimes it's humor that just goes too far. You know, well, you know, uh, you know a, a, a Jew, a rabbi, and whatever, go walk into the, the bar, and God is the bartender, okay? It seems harmless. It really does. But when you're looking at God, is God the image? The image you have is God as a bartender or just stuff like that. It just, it's, it's, it's flippant. You know what I mean? It's just, and it's, 
uh, we used to say as kids, um, you know, it would thunder. Oh, that's God. He's moving up, moving his furniture, and the angels wouldn't help, you know, or whatever. So he's having to drag his couch across heaven. And, you know, it's, it's flipping. And, and like I said, these things can seem very silly and very narrow, but not when we're talking about God. Okay? And like I said, it, it's, we're talking about maturity, I'm not talking about someone who's a new believer and is, and is, and is still trying to shed old things. But, but we want to talk about maturity. We want, to show, we want to put the bar up here and so that you'll know what you're, what you're really aiming towards is, is hallowing the name, that the name of God would be holy. And so when, the, when, when God's name rolls off your lips, there's power in it. It's not just, oh, he's just saying that again. Okay. The, and I'll, I'll, I'll just add this. Sometimes even talking about the devil flippantly can be wrong. And in the way that it, it, it takes him out of being a real enemy. And we need to, he is a real enemy and we need to treat him as so. And the fact of the matter is you are no match for the devil. Okay. If, if, you, if you could take on the devil, you wouldn't need Jesus, okay? And if you could work your way out of an, eternal, an eternity with the devil, you wouldn't need Jesus for that. The next one, familiarity, using familiar, familiar phrasing in place of his name. The one that, that's, of course, we all know, OMG, oh my God. All right, just, it, just how many times do we say that? And But like I said, it's, it's, it's not that you're saying anything bad as much as it is you're, you're saying God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But you're, you're, God never comes to your mind when you're saying it. And so you've taken out the presence of God from his name. You've separated the presence and the power from the name. When we talk about, you know, the man upstairs, the old man, you know who is watching. All right. It's just it's it, it's familiar. And I encourage you to pray the way you speak. We shouldn't have a prayer talk and then like our other talk. And if you can't pray the way you speak, then change the way you speak. Okay. There's a, there's a, a gentleman that I met years and years ago uh, named Bill. And I don't know how, how long Bill had been a believer, but he was a believer and but Bill was kind of raised. I, I, I think he was born in Ohio, raised in Ohio, kind of in the ghetto and and stuff like that. And he talked like it, but he was, he was a believer. And I remember a powerful prayer and he started it off like this. And I, I remember just being in awe of it. But you could really sense I was a, I was a young believer at the time. I was a teenager. And but you could sense the presence of God when he prayed. And uh, and there was other things that Bill was crazy, but but man, he but when he when he prayed, especially when he did some street prayer. Oh, my gosh, this guy could street witness like no other because he was from the street. But one day he said, yeah, man, he said, he said, let's pray. Let's pray. All right. Let's bow our head and pray. I'm going to pray. I don't remember what we're doing. We're we're at the park. And he says, uh, hey, you know, God, I know you be kicking it up there. And God, we be kicking it down here. But Lord, my prayer is that you and I be kicking it together. And then he went on to pray. But that's how he prayed. That's how he talked. And I thought, my, first of all, it caught my attention. I've never heard anybody pray to God like that. But that's how he talked. And I admired that. I admired that about him. Because when he talked to you, that's how he talked to you. It, was, it wasn't. Okay, all of a sudden he's praying to God and now he's got this whole other, other language going on. It wasn't fake. It wasn't, this was Bill being Bill and he was really praying. And his, and his word, and even though the, the, the culture of his words went against what, I'm not against it, but it was just a different culture than what I was from, we would have been praying the same thing. Why? Because he's praying on earth. You know, to be what on heaven, what uh, in, on earth, what is in heaven? You know, Lord, we know you're in heaven. I'm down here. I want to be in unity with you. This is what we're about to do. And I, I admire that. I admire that. 
And so if there's if if you have to pray, uh, change anything, I would don't get don't get, you know, what they call what the Christianese where you learn all the amen and brethren and brother and sister and and uh, amen and uh, hallelujah and all you get all this new vocabulary, but you have no idea what it means. And and then you you use it in a way that was never intended to be used and you use it uh, only around like church people and stuff like that. And, and I do and I do believe there, there are words in the church that are for the church. I, I don't think that we need to sound like the world. But if you sound like that, talk like that all the time. OK, talk like that all the time. Incred, incredulity, incredulity is the next one. Incredulity, refusing to believe in God's works and God's word. When you read the scripture, I challenge you to believe it. And when you talk about the scripture, I challenge you to, to talk about it in a way that, that, that is a, shows that you believe it. Okay, I was talking to someone not too long ago, and they were telling me all about a story in the Bible. And then they finished by saying, but I don't think that really happened. Well, then it really is not going to do you any good then. Okay, and really that, that's going against who God is and what he's done. The next one is hypocrisy, not living in holiness as God is holy, and yet having an expectation of others to do it. If you expect others to be live in holiness, but you won't do it yourself, that is, that is the epitome of hypocrisy, especially when you know what they should be doing, because if you know what they should be doing, that means you know what you should be doing, right? Right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't hold each other to standards and hold each other accountable, but don't hold someone accountable to something that you're not willing to hold yourself to. Okay? Now, and we're talking about patterns, patterns of sin in our life. Okay? It's not to say that you won't sin, but I'm talking about patterns. And last but not least is blasphemy. Using God's name to support evil things. One of the big ones out there is God is love. And therefore, everything that we attach the word love to has to be good because God is love and God is good, right? So if I say lesbian love or homosexual love, and I say, well, God is love, therefore, no, stop it. That's a stretch. And, and that's why I want to encourage you to go back and, and watch the Facebook things that I've been talking about on the word love. There are different types of love. And, and we only have one word in the English for love. It's called love. Okay? And we can say, I love my dog. I love my wife, I love my kids, I love my shoes. And they mean so many different things, okay? So do I believe that lesbian love exists? Yes, I do, in the sense that it is a, a, a love of passion, but not a godly love. It is a feeling I know people that are in love with their cars. And they love all the curves. And they're waxing it. Ooh, yeah. I'm not that guy. If I run it through the car wash, some, some, it's about to rain. But there are things that I, that I am passionate about. It's feelings only. It's not that I would give my life for this thing. So there's a, there's a difference. There's, there's, and I encourage you to go back on the Facebook Live thing. There's, like, there's five different loves in the Greek that we only have one word for, which is love. Just the word love. But there's, there's eros, there's um, sorgis, there's uh, all these um, love. But the most important one is agape love. And agape love is the only one that can be commanded. Okay, because it has nothing to do with feelings and it has everything to do with sacrifice. So the goal in this in keeping God's holy, I want to name three things, name three things that will help you to keep God's name holy. Number one, believe God exists. 
Do you believe God exists? Not that you just say he exists, but do you truly believe it? Do you truly believe it? The next thing, the next step, believe in his character. God does not change his character, okay? He does not change in character. He's changed in form, but he's never changed in character, okay? Before Jesus, he was never a man, okay? Now there is an actual man in the Godhead, okay? So that is a change, but that is not a change in character. That's only a change in form. Believe in his character that he's both good and he's powerful, that he wants to do good things and he has the power to do them. If not, what is the purpose of prayer? If I pray to a God who I'm not sure who exists, I'm not sure if he wants what's good for me, and I'm not even sure he could do it if he did, how powerful will my prayer be? And number three, believe that his presence is leaning into you. Believe that when you call his name, that he leans into you. What is the name? I wouldn't say I am. I, would, I, don't, ref, I don't call God I am. We would also, you know, call that Yahweh, J-H-V-H, Yahweh, Yahweh. If you want to know what Yahweh, maybe translated in English. Maybe the word always, always, I am, always, God is always, he's just always there, Yahweh, always. But the greatest name is not even the name Jesus. It's, the name alone is, 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 is not what gives, is not the power. There's a guy that was bagging my groceries several weeks ago, and his name was Jesus. They would probably call him Jesus. But he is not my savior. He's the guy that was bagging my groceries at AGB. So what is it? The name. There's more than just the name Jesus. And I want to read this in Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Verse, uh, one, uh, chapter 2 verse 8 through 11. Being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even the most humiliating death. Death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him. So this is God the Father exalting his son Jesus. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Which is Lord. The word Lord, that we get that from Yahweh. Lord, the Lordship, the I Am. Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven. So that's in heaven, in God's heaven. Those who are on earth and under the, under the earth, which is talking about uh, the, the, the devil, the demons, the principalities. And verse 11, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Je the reason Jesus' name is so powerful is because it's been infused with Lordship. God Himself has infused His name with His very being, the being of Yahweh, the Lord, the I Am, the Almighty, it's all in the one name. If you, there's thousands of names for God. The, the one true and living God, there are. And all through the Bible, they're, they're written in there. And we can do it and translate them to different languages and everything. But there's one name and one name we have to remember. And that's one name, Jesus. When you say Jesus, you are, you are encompassing the Lordship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all there. He is the Trinity. He, he encompasses the Trinity. So when we say the Spirit of God in this place, that's the Spirit of Jesus. They're one and the same. When we say Jesus, we're talking about the Son, but we're also talking about the Lordship of the Father. 
And so it's not to take away from the Father. In fact, in verse 11, you'll, if you read that again, it says, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Christ, or that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It does not take away from it. To, to, to hallow His name, to know that His name is holy and set apart. And there's two reasons we want to do this. There's two goals. There's two goals in saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Number one, that we would have a revelation of who God truly is. The real Jesus. A revelation of who He is. And number two, that we would have a reverence for who He is. A revelation of who he is but a revelation and I, I mean a reverence for who he is there was a prayer that I would pray over my kids as I would tuck them in and and sometimes I still will with with Rebecca the youngest but I'll, I'll pray this that they would be seekers of truth finders of truth lovers of truth and livers of truth and I broke it down like that for this reason. One, that they would be seekers of truth, that they would look for truth, that they would find it, that they would seek after it, that they would be wanting it, that they would be yearning for it. The Bible says to knock and it will be open. It doesn't say knock once. It's, it's talking about that present continuous knock and keep knocking until someone opens it up. Be a seeker of truth. Seek it out. Go on that journey. If, if truth takes you that way, then go that way. If truth takes you a different way, then go a different way. But wherever truth takes you, and I'm not talking about your truth. I'm talking about the truth. I'm not talking about your experience. I'm talking about His Word and His Spirit. And so be seekers of truth. Number two, that you would be finders of truth. That you would not stop seeking it until you found it. To, be a, to go on the journey is not enough. To not follow through and finish the journey. To be seekers of truth. To be finders of truth. To be lovers of truth. That when you find it, that you embrace it. That you love it. That you don't despise it. Sometimes the truth is the hardest thing to swallow. But I encourage you that you would seek it, that you would find it, and that you would love it, and then that you would live it out. That you would live it out, that you would have a revelation of truth, but a reverence of it. A revelation of who God is, but also a reverence for who He is. Would y'all just stand with me? Hey, if this message or any of the content that we've been putting out has blessed you, and you're wondering how you can partner with us in generosity, there are a couple ways to do that. You can download the PushPay app and you can search Marigold Church and you can give that way. You could also set up reoccurring giving and it's really user friendly. It makes it really easy to give. You could also text Marigold to 77977 and give that way. We believe God moves through a generous heart. And so we would love to see what God does through you as you partner with us and as we walk through this journey together.